This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Brad Bush. North of Boston by Robert Frost. Part 2. Home Burial. He saw her from the bottom of the stairs before she saw him. She was starting down, looking back over her shoulder at some fear. She took a doubtful step and then undid it to raise herself and look again. He spoke, advancing toward her. What is it you see from up there always? For I want to know. She turned and sank upon her skirts at that, and her face changed from terrified to dull. He said to gain time, What is it you see? Mounting until she cowered under him. I will find out now. You must tell me, dear. She, in her place, refused him any help with the least stiffening of her neck and silence. She let him look, sure that he wouldn't see, blind creature. And a while he didn't see, but at last he murmured, Oh, and again, oh. What is it? What? she said. Just that I see. You don't, she challenged. Tell me what it is. The wonder is I didn't see it at once. I never noticed it from here before. I must be wanted to it. That's the reason. The little graveyard where my people are. So small the window frames the whole of it. Not so much larger than a bedroom, is it? There are three stones of slate and one of marble. Broad-shouldered little slabs there in the sunlight on the side hill. We haven't to mind those, but I understand. It is not the stones, but the child's mound. Don't! 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 She cried. She withdrew, shrinking from beneath his arm that rested on the banister, and slid downstairs, and turned on him with such a daunting look. He said twice over before he knew himself, Can a man speak of his own child he's lost? Not you! Oh, where's my hat? Oh, I don't need it. I must get out of here. I must get air. I don't know rightly whether any man can. Amy, don't go to someone else this time. Listen to me. I won't come down the stairs. He sat and fixed his chin between his fists. There's something I should like to ask you, dear. You don't know how to ask it. Help me then. Her fingers moved the latch for all reply. My words are nearly always an offense. I don't know how to speak of anything so as to please you. But I might be taught, I should suppose. I can't say I see how. A man must partly give up being a man with women folk. We could have some arrangement by which I'd bind myself to keep hands off anything special you're a mind to name. Though I don't like such things twixt those that love. Two that don't love each other can't live together without them. But two that do can't live together with them. She moved the latch a little. Don't! Don't go. Don't carry it to someone else this time. Tell me about it, if it's something human. Let me into your grief. I'm not so much unlike other folks as you're standing there apart would make me out. Give me my chance. I do think, though, you overdo it a little. What was it that brought you up to think about the thing, to take your mother loss of a first child so inconsolably in the face of love? You'd think his memory might be satisfied. There you go, sneering now. I'm not. I'm not. You make me angry. I'll come down to you. God, what a woman. And it's come to this. A man can't speak of his own child that's dead. You can't because you don't know how. If you had feelings, you that dug with your own hand, how could you his little grave? I saw you from that very window there, making the gravel leap and leap in the air, leap up like that, like that, and land so lightly and roll back down the mound beside the hole. I thought, who is that man? I didn't know you. And I crept down the stairs and up the stairs to look again. And still, your spade kept lifting. Then you came in. I heard your rumbling voice out in the kitchen. And I don't know why, but I went to he near to see with my own eyes. You could sit there with the stains on your shoes of the fresh earth from your own baby's grave and talk about your everyday concerns. You had stood the spade up against the wall outside there in the entry, for I saw it. I shall laugh the worst laugh I ever laughed. I'm cursed. God, if I don't believe, I'm cursed. I can repeat the very words you were saying. 
Three foggy mornings and one rainy day will rot the best birch fence a man can build. Think of it. Talk like that at such a time. What did how long it takes a birch to rot to do with what was in our darkened parlor? You couldn't care. The nearest friends can go with anyone to death. Come so far short they might as well not try to go at all. No, from the time when one is sick to death, one is alone, and he dies more alone. Friends make pretense of following to the grave, but before one is in it, their minds are turned and making the best of their way back to life, and living people, and things they understand. But the world is evil. I won't have grief, so if I can change it, oh, I won't, I won't. There, you've said it all, and you feel better. You won't go now. You're crying. Close the door. The heart's gone out of it. Why keep it up? Amy? There's someone coming down the road. You, oh, you think the talk is all. I must go somewhere out of this house. How can I make you? If you do, she was opening the door wider. Where do you mean to go? First tell me that. I'll follow you and bring you back by force. I will. The Black Cottage We chanced in passing by that afternoon to catch it in a sort of special picture among tar-branded ancient cherry trees. Set well back from the road, in rank lodged grass, the little cottage we were speaking of, a front with just a door between two windows, fresh painted by the shower of a velvet black. We paused, the minister and I, to look. He made as if to hold it at arm's length or put the leaves aside that framed it in. Pretty, he said. Come in, no one will care. The path was a vague parting in the grass that led us to a weathered window sill. We pressed our faces to the pane. You see, he said, everything's as she left it when she died. Her sons won't sell the house or the things in it. They say they mean to come and summer here where they were boys. They haven't come this year. They live so far away. One is out west. It will be hard for them to keep their word. Anyway, they won't have the place disturbed. A buttoned haircloth lounge spread scrolling arms under a crayon portrait on the wall, done sadly from an old daguerreotype. That was the father as he went to war. She always, when she talked about war, sooner or later came and leaned, half knelt against the lounge beside it, though I doubt if such unlifelike lines kept power to stir anything in her after all the years. He fell at Gettysburg or Fredericksburg. I ought to know. It makes a difference which. Fredericksburg wasn't Gettysburg, of course. But what I'm getting to is how forsaken a little cottage this has always seemed, since she went more than ever but before. I don't mean altogether by the lives that had gone out of it, the father first, then the two sons, till she was left alone. Nothing could draw her after those two sons. She valued the considerate neglect she had at some cost taught them after years. I mean by the world's having passed it by. As we almost got to this afternoon, it always seems to me a sort of mark to measure how far fifty years have brought us. Why not sit down if you are in no haste? These doorsteps seldom have a visitor. The warping boards pulled out their own old nails with none to tread and put them in their place. She had her own idea of things, the old lady, and she liked talk. She had seen Garrison and Whittier and had her story of them. One wasn't long in the learning that she thought, whatever else the Civil War was for, it wasn't just to keep the states together, nor just to free the slaves, though it did both. She wouldn't have believed those ends enough to have given outright for them all she gave. Her giving somehow touched the principle that all men are created free and equal. And to hear her quaint phrases, so removed from the world's view today of all those things. That's a hard mystery of Jefferson's. What did he mean? Of course the easy way is to decide it simply isn't true. It may not be. I heard a fellow say so. But never mind. The Welshman got it planted where it will trouble us a thousand years. Each age will have to reconsider it. You couldn't tell her what the West was saying and what the South to her serene belief. 
She had some art of hearing and yet not hearing, the latter wisdom of the world. White was the only race she ever knew. Black she had scarcely seen, and yellow never. But how could they be made so very unlike by the same hand working in the same stuff? She had supposed the war decided that. What are you going to do with such a person? Strange how such in innocence gets in its own way. I shouldn't be surprised if in this world it were the force that would at last prevail. Do you know, but for her, there was a time when to please younger members of the church, or rather say non-members of the church, whom we all have to think of nowadays, I would have changed the creed a very little. Not that she ever had to ask me not to. It never got so far as that. But the bare thought of her old tremulous bonnet in the pew, and of her half asleep, was too much for me. Why, I might wake her up and startle, startle her. It was the words descended into Hades that seemed too pagan to our liberal youth. You know, they suffered from a general onslaught. And well, if they weren't true, why keep right on saying them, like the heathen? We could drop them. Only... There was the bonnet in the pew. Such a phrase couldn't have meant that much to her. But suppose she had missed it from the creed, as a child misses the unsaid good night and falls asleep with heartache. How should I feel? I'm just as glad she made me keep hands off, for dear me, why abandon a belief merely because it ceases to be true? Cling to it long enough, and not a doubt it will turn true again, for so it goes. Most of the change we think we see in life is due to truce being in and out of favor. As I sit here, and oftentimes, I wish I could be monarch of a desert land. I could devote and dedicate forever to the truths we keep coming back and back to. So desert it would have to be, so walled by mountain ranges half in summer snow, no one would con covet it or think it worth the pains of conquering to force change on. Scattered oasis where men dwelt, but mostly sand dunes held loosely and tamarisk, blown over and over themselves in idleness. Sand grains should sugar in the natal dew, the baby born to the desert, the sandstorm retard mid-waist my cowering caravans. There are bees in this wall. He struck the clapboards. Fierce heads looked out, small bodies pivoted. We rose to go. Sunset blazed on the windows. Blueberries You ought to have seen what I saw on my way to the village, through Mortensen's pasture today. Blueberries, as big as the end of your thumb, real sky blue and heavy and ready to drum in the cavernous pale of the first one to come. And all ripe together, not some of them green and some of them ripe, you ought to have seen. I don't know what part of the pasture you mean. You know, where they cut off the woods. Let me see. It was two years ago, or no. Can it be no longer than that? And the following fall, the fire ran and burned it all up but the wall. Why, there hasn't been time for the bushes to grow. That's always the way with the blueberries, though. There may not have been the ghost of a sign of them anywhere under the shade of the pine. But get the pine out of the way, you may burn the pasture all over until the fern or grass blade is left. Not to mention a stick and presto, they're up all around you as thick and hard to explain as a conjurer's trick. It must be on charcoal they fatten their fruit. I taste in them sometimes the flavor of soot. And after all, really, they're ebony-skinned. The blue's but a mist from the breath of the wind, a tarnish that goes at the touch of the hand, and less than the tan with which pickers are tanned. Does Mortensen know what he has, do you think? He may, and not care, and so leave the chewink to gather them for him. You know what he is. He won't make the fact that they're rightfully his an excuse for keeping us other folk out. I wonder you didn't see Lauren about. The best of it was that I did. Do you know, I was just getting through what the field had to show, and over the wall and into the road, when who should come by, 
with a Democrat load of all the young chattering Lorens alive, but Loren, the fatherly, out for a drive. He saw you then? What did you do? Did he frown? He just kept nodding his head up and down. You know how politely he always goes by. But he thought a big thought I could tell by his eye, which, being expressed, might be in this effect. I have left those there berries, I shrewdly suspect, to ripen too long. I am greatly to blame. He's a thriftier person than some I could name. He seems to be thrifty. And hasn't he need, with all the mouths of those young lorns to feed? He has brought them all up on wild berries, they say, like birds. They store a great many away. They eat them the year round, and those that they don't eat they sell in the store and buy shoes for their feet. Who cares what they say? It's nice to live, just taking what nature is willing to give, not forcing her hand with harrow and plough. I wish you had seen his perpetual bow and the air of the youngsters. Not one of them turn, and they look so solemn, absurdly concerned. I wish I knew half of what the flock of them know of where all those berries and other things grow. Cranberries and bogs and raspberries up on top of the boulder-strewn mountain, and when they will crop. I met them one day, and each had a flower stuck into his berries, as fresh as a shower. Some strange kind. They told me it hadn't a name. I've told you once, not long after we came, I almost provoked poor Loren to mirth by going to him of all people on earth to ask if he knew any fruit he to be had for the picking. The rascal... He said he'd be glad to tell me if he knew, but the year had been bad. There had been some berries, but those were all gone. He didn't say where they had been. He went on, I'm sure, I'm sure, as polite as could be. He spoke to his wife in the door. Let me see, Mame. We don't know any good burying place. It was all he could do to keep a straight face. If he thinks all the fruit that grows wild is for him, he'll find he's mistaken. See here, for a whim, we'll pick in the Mortensons' pasture this year. We'll go in the morning, that is. If it's clear and the sun shines out warm, the vines must be wet. It's so long since I picked, I almost forget how we used to pick berries. We took one look round, then sank out of sight like trolls underground, and saw nothing more of each other or heard, unless, when you said I was keeping a bird away from its nest, and I said, it was you, well, one of us is, for complaining it flew around and around us. And then, for a while, we picked till I feared you had wandered a mile, and I thought I'd lost you. I lifted a shout too loud for the distance you were, it turned out, for when you made answer, your voice was as low as talking. You stood up beside me, you know. We shan't have the place to ourselves to enjoy, not likely, when all the young Lorens deploy. They'll be there tomorrow or even tonight. They won't be too friendly. They may be polite. To people they look on as having no right to pick with their picking. But we won't complain. You ought to have seen how it looked in the rain, the fruit mixed with the water in layers of leaves, like two kinds of jewels, a vision for thieves. A Servant to Servants I didn't make you know how glad I was to have you come and camp here on our land. I promised myself to get down some day and see the way you lived, but I don't know. With a house full of hungry men to feed, I guess you're fine. It seems to me I can't express my feelings any more than I can raise my voice or want to lift my hand. Oh, I can lift it when I have to. Do you ever feel so? I hope you never. It's got so I don't even know for sure whether I'm glad, sorry, or anything. There's nothing but a voice-like left inside that seems to tell me how I ought to feel and would feel if I wasn't all gone wrong. You take the lake. I look and look at it. I see it's a fair, pretty sheet of water. I stand and make myself repeat out loud the advantages it has, so long and narrow like a deep piece of some old running river cut short off at both ends. It lies five miles straight away through the mountain notch from the sink window where I wash the plates. 
and all our storms come up towards the house, drawing the slow waves wider and wider and whiter. It took my mind off donuts and soda biscuit to step outdoors and take the water dazzle a sunny morning, or take the rising wind about my face and body through my wrapper. When a storm threatened from the dragon's den and a cold chill shivered across the lake, I see it's a fair, pretty sheet of water, our Willoughby. How did you hear of it? I expect, though, that everyone's heard of it. In a book about ferns? Listen to that. You let things more like feathers regulate your going and coming. And you like it here? I can see how you might. But I don't know. It would be different if more people came, for then there would be business. As it is, the cottage is Lynn-built. Sometimes we rent them, sometimes we don't. We have a good piece of shore that ought to be worth something, and may yet. But I don't count on it much as Lynn. He looks on the bright side of everything, including me. He thinks I'll be all right with doctoring. But it's not medicine. Lowe was the only doctors dared to say so. It's rest I want. There, I've set it out. From cooking meals for hungry hired men and washing dishes after them. From doing things over and over that just won't stay done. By good rights, I ought not to have so much put on me. But there seems no other way. Lynn says one steady pull more ought to do it. He says the best way out is always through. And I agree with that. For insofar as I can see, no way out but through. Leastways for me. And then they'll be convinced. It's not that Lynn don't want the best for me. It was his plan, our moving over in beside the lake, from where that day I showed you we used to live, ten miles from anywhere, We didn't change without some sacrifice, but Len went at it to make up the loss. His work's a man's, of course, from sun to sun, but he works when he works as hard as I do, though there's small profit in comparisons. Women and men will make them all the same, but work ain't all. Len undertakes too much. He's into everything in town. This year it's highways, and he's got too many men around him to look after that make waste. They take advantage of him shamefully, and proud too of themselves for doing so. We have four here to board, great good-for-nothings, sprawling about the kitchen with their talk while I fry their bacon. Much they care. No more put out in what they do or say than if I wasn't in the room at all. Coming and going all the time they are. I don't learn what their names are, let alone their characters or whether they are safe to have inside the house with doors unlocked. I'm not afraid of them, though, if they're not afraid of me. There's two can play at that. I have my fancies. It runs in the family. My father's brother wasn't right. They kept him locked up for years back there at the old farm. I've been away once, yes. I've been away. The state asylum. I was prejudiced. I wouldn't have set anyone of mine there. You know, the old idea. The only asylum was the poorhouse, and those who could afford, rather than send their folks to such a place, kept them at home. And it does seem more human. But it's not so. The place is the asylum. There they have every means proper to do with, and you aren't darkening other people's lives. Worse than no good to them, and they no good to you in your condition. You can't know affection or the want of it in that state. I've heard too much of the old-fashioned way. My father's brother, he went mad quite young. Some thought he'd been bitten by a dog because the violence took on the form of carrying his pillow in his teeth. It's more likely that he was crossed in love, or so the story goes. It was some girl. Anyway, all he talked about was love. They soon saw he would do someone a mischief if he wasn't kept strict watch of, and it ended in fathers building him a sort of cage, or room within room, of hickory poles, like stanchions in the barn from floor to ceiling, 
a narrow passage all the way around. Anything they put in for furniture, he'd tear to pieces, even a bed to lie on. So they made a place comfortable with straw, like a beast stall to ease their consciences. Of course, they had to feed him without dishes. They tried to keep him clothed, but he paraded with his clothes on his arm, all of his clothes. Cruel, it sounds. I suppose they did the best they knew. And just when he was at the height, father and mother married, and mother came, a bride, to help take care of such a creature and accommodate her young life to his. That was what marrying father meant to her. She had to lie and hear loved things made dreadful by his shouts in the night. He'd shout and shout until the strength was shouted out of him, and his voice died down slowly from exhaustion. He'd pull his bars apart like bow and bowstring, and let them go and make them twang until his hands had worn them smooth as an ox bow. And then he'd crow as if he thought that child's play, the only fun he had. I've heard them say, though, they found a way to put a stop to it. He was before my time. I never saw him. But the pen stayed exactly as it was there in the upper chamber in the L, a sort of catch-all full of attic clutter. I often think of the smooth hickory bars. It got so, I would say, you know, half fooling. It's time I took my turn upstairs in jail. Just as you will, till it becomes a habit. No wonder I was glad to get away. Mind you, I waited till Lynn said the word. I didn't want the blame if things went wrong. I was glad, though. No end, when he moved out, and I looked to be happy. And I was, as I said for a while. But I don't know. Somehow the change wore out like a prescription. And there's more to it than just widow views and living by a lake. I'm past such help. Unless Len took the notion, which he won't, and I won't ask him. It's not sure enough. I suppose I've got to go the road I'm going. Other folks have to, and why shouldn't I? I almost think if I could do like you, drop everything and live out on the ground. But it might be, come night, I shouldn't like it, or a long rain. I should soon get enough and be glad of a good roof overhead. I've lain awake think of you, I warrant, more than you have yourself some of these nights. The wonder was the tents weren't snatched away from over you as you lay in your beds. I haven't courage for a risk like that. Bless you, of course. You're keeping me from work. But the thing of it is, I need to be kept. There's work enough to do. There's always that. But behind's behind. The worst you can do is set me back a little more behind. I shan't catch up in this world anyway. I'd rather you not go unless you must. End of part two.